Hello everyone, today we are talking about Gary Newman. I got to see him in concert a few weeks ago with Frontline Assembly and Ministry and he was beyond awesome. He was so awesome that I didn't want to hesitate doing this show anymore because I want you, if he comes to town, your town, or he comes near you, to go out and buy tickets to see him. You will not regret it. He was beyond awesome to the point of he made it to one of my, well, my very small list of the best, the best concerts I've ever seen. And I didn't expect that. I knew it was going to be good, but I didn't know how good. So today I thought we would review it and I would talk about it with you and hopefully get you wanting to see him and putting him on your radar, a guy you never thought you'd go to. I have co-workers who, um, they tease me. They're like, you're going to go see the guy that did Cars? And I'm like, yeah, but you don't understand. It's more than that. I'm like, God, it's going to be so boring. He's going to do Cars and that's it. I'm like, you don't know. You just don't know how cool this guy is. He is so cool. <laughs> very, very cool. And actually, I think off the stage, he's probably a really cool guy, too. So, first, I saw Ministry, Gary Newman, and Frontline Assembly opening at Terminal 5 in New York City three weeks ago. Um, so, what, end of, um, end of March 2024? And it was at, uh, it, yeah, before I get ahead of myself. The venue, awesome. I'd never known Terminal 5. When I lived in New York, it didn't exist. It's very intimate. It's an old warehouse or factory or something. So it's very long. And there's floors that have become the balcony. And great view from pretty much everywhere. Just a really great space. Great sound. It reminds me of Irving Plaza. If you're in New York and you know Irving Plaza. I went to many shows there. Uh, very, very good venue. Very happy with that. If I had seen them in Boston the night before, that was in a large arena, and it may have affected the show. I think Gary should be seen up close and personal, not on a video screen, not way, way back on Tier 3. I think he's an up close and personal guy. So that's my only small print that I want to add to this. So first I want to talk about Frontline Assembly, and then Ministry, and then we'll delve into Gary Newman. Just to be fair to the full night. And it provides context. So Frontline Assembly has been around since 1983. When it comes to industrial music, they're in the history books, even if you don't know them. They're not a household name like Nine Inch Nails, but they're in the books. They've had an influence. The guy who founded it is the singer, and he was in Skinny Puppy before. I found the show to be... Um, well, it had good lights. Yeah, had really good lights. I had a friend who was with me who's also a musician, and he kind of said the same thing. They had good drums, too. But, triggered drums. So there was a wonderful bass, uh, sorry, a wonderful drum sound. It was just full of bass, and it was it was really awesome. In the way that, if you've ever listened to the Ghost albums, just really listen for the drums. I don't know who their production guy is or engineer when they're recording their drums, but I want his phone number for the day I make an album, because it's just this amazing sound. I went out running the other night for a half hour, and I was just listening to the drums from Ghost. It was just so good. And that's what... Frontline Assembly had, except they were triggered. So the guy playing was doing his best Keith Moon impression, but he would hit the snare 
and it would be this massive sound. Hit the cymbal, massive sound. And my friend and I were both like, oh god, these are just triggered drums. Whatever he's doing is being accentuated. It had to be, because it was just, it was just too much for this little kid he had. It was a little off-putting, but the drums sounded great. But to watch, like, I tried not to watch them because I was like, this is just something, it, it just, I know it's off. There was a guitar player who was, I guess, okay, had long dreads. And um, I feel sorry, though, because the guitar player would be doing something like, dun 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 for the entire song. <laughs> just like, I'm looking at this guitar player going, oh my god, that poor person, that poor guy must be so bored because it's like just nothing for forever. And then there was a keyboard player, <clears throat> excuse me, who's been with the band for some years. And every so often he would play something and I'd be like, oh, that's kind of cool. I like that. But you know how I just said the word forever? Well, all the songs seem to last forever. And not in the Grateful Dead sort of way where they go from one to another. No, no, this just was like, no, 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 ten minutes later. No, 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 like, oh my god. With no change. Or a slight change, and they would go back to da da da. It was like they took everything that sounded like a good song and added five minutes to it, figuratively speaking. I don't think they really did, but everything just sounded so monotonous after a while. And my friend and I were both like, yeah, it just, he would get hyped and then it would drag. Uh, uh, uh. And he knew front of assembly and he was like, yeah, it just dragged. I don't know who told them to extend everything into monotony. A jam band gives you some variety. This was just not. And it became very repetitive and boring. So whenever you heard something really cool, for me anyways, as a non-fan, I would be bored by the end. Like, I'd be like, okay, can we have something else, please? And then the next song would come up, but I was so bored, it kind of just all sounded alike. And then there was the singer, um, who looks like a 50-year-old man with a beer gut who hates life and is very frustrated and is bored. Basically, this... Guy, gray hair, beer gut. Please lose the beer gut. Guys, doesn't look good. Going around, walking around, sulking, sulking on stage. That's what it looked like to me. Like a guy who wanted to be famous, it never happened, and now he's just been a drunk and is just miserable. He had zero energy. Walking on stage, waiting for your cue, looked so bad. And then he would just stand there and like, like wave to people while he's singing his lyrics that none of us could decipher. It was just so uncomfortable. And at one point he played a little um, drum. Both him and the keyboard player would then get a snare drum and or a tom and play it to um, the drum sound. This poor singer, though, the way they positioned it was his back was almost to us, so he's pounding the drums away from us, kind of killing the feeling of it. It was so weird. It was not exciting. It, it wasn't bad. Had a good light show, but I wasn't inspired afterwards to go listen to them. And that's not good. You don't want people walking away who don't know you, who just are like, okay, I'm fine. Like, I don't need to hear more. And I haven't. I haven't listened to more of them. Now, I'm a little being a little critical on this because there is something I'm going to do when I talk about Gary that will compare and contrast to Frontline Assembly. So I'm, I'm being a little critical because honestly, the guy walking around on stage going this, I saw Joe Lynn Turner on stage. You know, Joe Lynn, famous, same thing. I'm looking at him going, yeah, lose the beer gut, buddy. And he's just walking around singing too. I saw Stephen Piercy walking around and singing. This is what everyone does. So it's really not like this guy's unusual. It's just he's in his 50s. And they're all in their 50s. So it's not unusual at all. But I, I'm going to be comparing and contrasting, contrasting to Gary. So you'll see why I'm being a little extra critical. But first, let's jump to ministry. Now, before I went down, I decided to listen to ministry because I kind of remembered them from growing up, you know, MTV. Ministry was sort of the uh, the the keeper of the flame for industrial music, I think, pre Nine Inch Nails. When I got into ministry, Nine Inch Nails was full on, and it was Marilyn Manson in college. 
when I was in college, and I never went back and got into ministry. Sorry, Nine Inch Nails and Marilyn Manson kind of then brought it to the mainstream, and I never went back and listened to ministry. So I just now heard them for the first time before I went. I listened to like their greatest hit stuff, um, more than just Jesus something, my hot rod, I forget the name of it. And then after I came back, I listened to them again. I didn't like anything before I went to the point where if my friend hadn't been with me, <laughs> I was actually going to leave early. Even skipping the um, encore with Gary Newman, which we did, and I'm, I don't care that we did, just because it, I just didn't like them. So after I came back, I listened to them again to see if they sucked. Yes, they still suck. I can't stand them. They're horrible. There's a review I saw of Gary and this particular tour, maybe it was the last tour, uh, where they had played together, and they described Gary, all this stuff, and then it was ministry, and the review was loud, period. Yep, it was very loud. Very, very loud. Excruciatingly painful, horribly loud, and it was just noise for me. There was a guitar player up there playing something, or it sounded like, this is what I, I swore I hear for the whole show, while someone does a solo and some drums are playing and other someone's singing, who knows what's going on. It's all I heard was it reminded me of when I saw Cradle with Filth and I'm literally watching guys play like two notes. I was like, oh my god, this is obnoxious. And it was an hour of two notes. They just played two notes on their guitars for an hour, seeing seeing Cradle of Filth and Ministry. It was so bad. It was just like, oh my god, you've turned the volume up on nothing. And it was just distortion through the roof, and Uncle Owl's up there, blah, 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 blah. Couldn't hear it, couldn't do it. It was just noise. And Jesus saved my hut rod, or built my hut rod, whatever it is, has so much pre-recording on it that it was like... Song starts, and two minutes later, he starts singing after we've heard all this stuff. It's it's a little weird. I think it works better on the album. But I just, nothing, nothing about them reverberates with me as anything other than noise. I'm sorry if you like them, but I, nothing. I kept turning to my friend. We were sitting at the bar, and he's staying next to me. And I kept going, there was a, this was the only way to enjoy this concert. I kept going, you know, uh, I think Willie Nelson did this. <laughs> And he'd start like, and I go, you should hear Willie Nelson's version of this song. And uh, I, I'd be like, um, I wonder if they've done an acoustic album. <laughs> and at one point, I said to him, I said, oh, I'm so disappointed by these lyrics. He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, the song had a lyric like, F my white ass or F the white asshole or something. And I said to my friend, I said, oh, you know, he was singing F my white ass. He goes, yeah. And I said, I thought, I thought he was singing F the waitress. And I said, I, was, I could really get behind that song because, you know, sometimes you see a sexy waitress. But he wasn't. I'm so disappointed. <laughs> that was all I could do with that was just to make fun of it. It was just the epitome of everything I don't want in a show. But... The drummer, I have to give kudos to, he was getting a workout and pounding it, and he wasn't doing trigger drums. He was really playing, and I give him so much credit. He was really going at it. He was just overwhelmed by keyboards, um, two or three guitars and a bass, to and vocals. But he was really on top of stuff, and there was one song that got my attention. And my friend had seen him numerous times, and he liked this song too, but I don't know the name of it. It starts off with a bunch of faux tabla playing, faux Indian. I can't remember if it was him playing something that sounded like a tabla, or if it was recorded, or if there was a recording that he was throwing stuff into. I don't remember, but being a fan of Indian music and a lover of Indian culture and Indian music, that I, I liked, even though it wasn't authentic it was it was in in the mood of but it was really cool and, and yeah I, the drummer of ministry is awesome the rest of it i just kind of like man i don't get it and those guitar players are just bringing in a paycheck to play two notes <laughs> i'm serious i was just like oh my god and then we have mr gary newman who blew them all under the table threw them under the bus Whatever you want to say, he blew them out the door and they should never play music again. Let me take a drink here. So I seriously think that you should all go and see Gary Newman. 
every single one of you should see him. Now, if you like classic rock, this may not be your thing. He changes the music a lot. So if you're expecting da -da -da -da, two way army type cars, you're not going to get it. He doesn't sound anything like that anymore. If you want a classic rock guy up there smiling in a little suit, you're not going to get that in either. He's not a nostalgia act. If you want uh, some interesting music, if you like industrial, if you like metal, you like stuff that's moody, you should go and see him. And you know who should really go and see him? All you front men. All of you. I don't care if you're famous. I don't care if you're Stephen Pierce or Alice Cooper. You need to go see him so you can see one of the greatest shows in your life and learn how you're not cutting it. So many front men, when they're on stage, are like the guy in Frontline Assembly. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. You the blue, 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 blue. F the waitress. Blah, blah, blah. Gary Newman didn't do that. I never once thought that I was seeing a band sing their songs. What I thought was I was in an experience. That's right. An experience that was unlike anything. It wasn't just a musician with some hired hands. It was a performance. And most, most musicians that I see on stage are trying to perform. He wasn't performing. He was doing like a theater production. It was mind boggling. You should see him. You should see him to learn how to make your band better. I was so enthralled by him that I, I'm thinking to myself just the other day, I want to join a rock band and sing just so I can get up there and do what he was doing because it was infectious. So I have some photos here I'm going to pull up while I'm talking. This will help me describe a little bit as I go forward. So these are not great photos, just me and my cell phone that I would just quickly pull out. I don't like to be with that guy who's like standing like this. So I just pull it out and down and that's it. Um, but it'll give you an, uh, uh, some idea of what he was doing. This one's kind of cool though. Uh, so the set was very basic. You see, it's just some lights and some videos video screaming at him and those light beams you just saw in the last photo. That was it. Nothing fancy. He had a drummer, a keyboardist, a bass player, and one guitar player. That's it. I don't know. I forget from reading his book, which I'll, I'll mention here before the show's over, how he came to this place from where he was in the 70s with Two-Way Army to where he is now. But if anyone gave him any advice, that person needs to be applauded. Because it felt like, well, let's be honest, Gary Newman's not the greatest singer in the world, not the greatest songwriter in the world. He's not the greatest musician. He confesses in his, his, his memoir that he doesn't know much about music. For some, he's a one-hit wonder, even though he's actually had a few hits like Metal and Down in the Park. But somehow, he managed to take these limits and create a show that went well beyond them. And I don't see musicians do that. They just do their stuff. He went beyond all his limits. And thus, I would say his show is better than Alice Cooper, who I saw. Better than Rat. Better than uh, Motley Crue. The only person I can think of who I've seen, who I think put on a good show who is equal to this is Ronnie James Dio. I saw Ronnie James Dio with Heaven and Hell, uh, Madison Square Garden, a few years, you know, uh, I don't know, 13, 14 years ago. And he's on stage and he's vibrant and he's in it. He put on a great show. And when I've watched videos of Elvis, uh, Loha from Hawaii, 6 a Comeback Special, he has it. Mick Jagger has it. But most of the musicians I think of, they don't have it. They're performing for us. We're not in an experience. Gary Newman created an experience. And what is, what is it that makes him different? What is the key here? So when a performer gets on stage, they're singing, rah, 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 and they're standing up there with lyrics. Imagine Gary Newman up there going, cars, cars. Cars, and he just stands there. Oh my God! Well, he did once, and he had this whole robot 
craft work type thing. But I don't know if we could pull that off today. 66 year old guy. Cars. I wonder what for dinner. I don't know. Cars. Gosh, did I text my wife earlier? Cars. It wouldn't work. So he comes on and he dances. He moves. He doesn't stop moving. He does stuff constantly. From the moment the show starts to the moment it ends, 66 years old, and he has the energy of a 30-year-old. He doesn't stop moving. And he's not waving his hands around like Morrissey in 1980-something with flowers, going wild. No. He is listening to the music and dancing to it and responding to the drum beats. And, and, and you see him go up and down, and then he'll come up to the microphone, and he'll grab the mic, as you see in this picture here, and he'll sing into it, and then he waves it around, and then he moves around, and, and he comes back to it, and he does stuff. And he was in the moment with the music, listening to his own music, and not performing for us, but he was just in the moment performing for himself. And it was unbelievable. You see a picture right here of him below the mic. Sometimes I was like, is, is he even close enough to the mic to get it? Because he'd be like far away and then it comes up and he grabs it. It almost didn't matter. And I like this picture with his arm up in the air. He used to do this pose a lot. And it's all very spontaneous. And he never spoke to the audience. He didn't say, hi, how you doing? Hey, everybody in the house. No, he never did that. It was always, that's why I say a theater production, it was always like a theater production where we're watching people perform and they're doing their show, but they're not performing for us. And it just dramatically changed everything about this. He was invested in the moment. He was listening. He was responding to the music. At one point, he actually crashed into his guitar player because <laughs> the guitar player was moving around and he moved around, and they just crashed right into each other and they kind of like, whoop. He never walked on stage and he doesn't have a beard. He's in great shape and he's in really great shape and he was so physical in ways that I think I would run out of energy maybe halfway through. I don't know what he was on maybe tons of Red Bull, but something. He put so much into that show and he never stopped. And it was addicting to watch because you're just so into it. Because he's into it, you're into it. Unlike uh, Frontline Assembly, where the guy's up there, whatever, wandering around. And when you have a band like this, like Frontline, where no one else is moving other than the singer, it's like Depeche Mode or Erasure or Pet Shop Boys or everything but the girl, all the attention's on the singer. So if the singer is bored, walking around, waiting for his cue, I'm bored. But Gary wasn't bored. And I, I can think of very few musicians I've seen. Like I said, um, Ronnie James Steele. I was at Ted Nugent, also I put in this category. He just loves playing so much, and you can tell he just enjoys what he's playing, that he doesn't care if there's an audience, you know? And he's enjoying it, and I'm enjoying it. And... It made up for the fact that Gary's not the best singer. He's not the best lyricist. He, he, he's, he's not on anyone's hit list. But he has compensated in waves that far better musicians I have not seen compensated. I didn't walk out of Gary Newman going, oh, that was a good show. No, I walked out of Gary Newman going, wow, I want to sing in a band. Wow, that was awesome. Wow, I feel like I've been transported someplace and then put back. I need a drink. <laughs> and my friend actually only knew uh, down in the uh, down in the park and metal, and maybe he didn't even know metal, but he knew um, you know cars. He didn't know anything modern by Gary Newman, so he was totally doing this to hang out with me and and on my and my word that this was going to be great. He was enthralled. He's like oh my god, tell me what to listen to. Like, we were talking about Gary during the break before ministry. He's like, oh my god, this is just, this was so much fun. And then later in the bar, he's like, I really want to listen to this guy more. And I said, well, it's going to be different, but, you know, I think you'll enjoy it. So it was such a great show. Also, what made it was his guitar player and bass player, because if you've looked at uh, Gary's last few albums, they all sort of have this end-of-the-world apocalypse theme sort of thing that runs through them 
And so that's sort of the stage show he has. So he's got these two musicians who are both tall, bald, and they're very thin, and they both wear dresses. And they're not really dresses. That more is made to look like someone found some world. Uh, check out his video, My Name is Ruin. It's one of my favorite songs by him. Uh, his daughter, Raven, does the backing vocals. She's now got her own little thing started um, with two singles as of this point. But it's just the two of them in this outland. It's just life is... You know, like, like it's like the end of the world, and they're surviving. Uh, it's very reminiscent of Dune, the movie, the new movies. Uh, and and if you and if you get the feel of that, that's kind of what they're trying to do on stage. And so the bass player is really cool because you know, tall guy, bald, and he's up there, but he would do these weird movements, and he'd be playing his bass up or down, and and then he when he wasn't playing, he'd wave his hand around and and wave his head around sort of like a mutant or something like oh you know like the world is crazy and i've been knocked out of my brain so many times from the radiation that and it's just this weird thing and it was enticing because you're watching him and forgetting to watch gary but it just created this this performance and then you had the guitar player on the other side also tall thin guy a little bit older guy i think and uh he would have his own shtick where he was doing sign language with the audience that was just gibberish sign language. You know, and he was like trying to talk to us and it was really weird. Like, like he was trying to get us to understand something or be a part of something because he's in this place. Uh, here you can see a picture of the bass player. Uh, that little red blip, there's the bass player right there. So you see he's, he's tall and thin and, and they're wearing these dresses. It was so cool. Uh, and there's the guitar player in this in this photo, and the keyboardist. It just made this whole thing like I I don't know if they directed this, if they created this years ago, and it varied the tour over the years. But whoever came up with this and told the musicians to do this or whatever is pure genius. I, I don't know who Gary has on his team, but it's it's an amazing team. And it created this phenomenal show. Seriously, phenomenal. Uh, these photos don't do it justice. There's some, there, I did see one video online, but the sound was really bad. Um, I would just say YouTube Gary and study this man. Study him and learn how to do a show. You don't need charisma. You don't need whatever. You don't need to get the audience on your side. He didn't. He didn't talk to us. We didn't exist for him, almost. But he wasn't like a shoegazer, wasn't that? We were there, but he wasn't interacting with us. So it, it was a whole different thing. And I think you could just learn so much from studying Carrie Newman, of all people. So that being said, I just want to talk about how I got into him. And that will just bring this video to a close. And this will lead me into talking about his book. So I always knew who Gary was. You know, of course, we all know Cars. And I had listened to the albums he did in the 80s. And they're horrible. <laughs> I just really don't like them. A lot of people don't like them. And his career actually kind of died. Uh, he's an airplane pilot. And I owned a couple airplanes, or maybe still does. And used to do deliveries for people because music became a side job at one point, not his main source of income, because he literally fell off the charts and fell out of public eye, and, and people didn't like what he was doing. And I didn't either. A lot of us didn't, and I didn't give him the time of day. So I always look at his 80s career, and since we're talking 80s, I'll, I'm going to take these photos away. You've seen them now. There's not that many of them. I always look at his 80s career in... Um, comparison to David Bowie, Young Americans. Both of them had gone simple band setup, and now we're expanding their templates with big bands. Uh, I think, uh, what is it? Was it um, Stevie Ray Vaughan or somebody who played, or Carlos Santana that played for, um, I don't know, someone of that caliber who played on one of these David Bowie songs. Um, he had all these people in the studio with him, it just big sounds. And he's doing these songs which are sort of bluesy, and they're jazzy, and they're rock, and they're a mix of things, and they just groove young Americans, and you're just in it. 
And I feel Gary was kind of doing the same thing in the 80s. He was bringing in lots of musicians. It wasn't just him and his producer with the keyboards, lots of stuff, live instruments, saxophone. He was going in a more jazz direction, except David Bowie succeeded. Gary Newman didn't. And I think the reason is because David Bowie was going pop and he grooved. Gary Newman was going jazz experimental with no groove. I always think of, of you know, uh, David Bowie swiping in, does a great sax solo, and we're out. Song's over. Gary Newman, we're doing a sax solo. Two minutes later, we're still doing the solo. Like, it was just like pushing limits, but it just doesn't work. And it just falls apart for me. And I've heard the albums, and there's like a few moments I like, but they just don't work for me. They... I don't know. I don't know what he was doing, but it's a good idea, and then it failed. And then I have heard, I don't know where I heard this from, that his career had basically died when Nine Inch Nails came up. And Trent Reznor, Reznor was like, yeah, yeah, I, I owe a lot to Gary Newman, who was an inspiration. And Gary heard Nine Inch Nails and went, that's what I always wanted to do but I never thought of doing metal. Oh, shit. And then reinvented himself over a few albums and came out at the other end with this very moody, industrial, quasi-metal sound, which he's been working on ever since. I don't know if that's true. Uh, I, it, I, I know Trent has honored Gary, and it's kind of a weird thing because Gary inspired Trent, Trent inspired Gary, and my friend said to me, goes, oh, wow, you know, he sounds a lot like Frontline Assembly and Nine Inch Nails, and I'm like, yeah, that is kind of ironic, given he's the one that inspired those bands. Now he sounds like his students. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's a good a good story, even if it's not true, if I've just made it up somehow. I mean, it sounds sort of legitimate, because in the 90s, it's 1994, I think the album is Sacrifice, it's considered his comeback because he finally solidified his sound away from this jazz stuff, away from this, this whatever, experimental stuff, into more traditional sounds and metal and industrial. There's a couple albums that are kind of getting there, and then he finally solidifies it in 1994, Sacrifice, and from there on out, it's just been a wonderful journey. I discovered him, he came up on one of my feeds, the song My Name is Ruin came up. I was like, oh, I'll listen to him, you know, why not? I'm kind of, he's one of these weird guys that I would hear about every so often. I'd listen to the 80s stuff, as I said. Didn't give him any more time, but, you know, he's just one of these weird enigmas, you know, like like Adamant or whatever. You never hear from him, all of a sudden you hear from him, I'm like, oh, okay, gosh, let me listen to the song. And I just fell in love with My Name is Ruin, and then I went back and investigated all the albums again. And the way I see his career is he had his hit out the door, Cars, had a few more hits, faded away, and then rediscovered his sound. And today, he may not have any hits. The latest album, Intruder, which is what he's touring now, doesn't have any hits. But I think creatively, cre creatively he's at his peak. Uh, I, I, he's, he's made it. He has made the best albums of his career since Sacrifice, uh, Splinter, Jagged, um, all the albums, basically since 1994, I would highly recommend you to listen to. They are phenomenally great, moody, industrial things that are just the best things he's ever done. And they don't have the hits and no one knows about them. Or not enough people know about them. Everyone knows Cars. Like I said, my coworkers were teasing me, are you going to go hear the guy who does Cars? I'm like, no, no, you haven't heard My Name is Ruin. You need to hear My Name is Ruin. Or you need to hear in the Intruder song or these other songs. They're so good. Cars is almost like a joke. Like, who cares at this point? That's a completely different musician than the one who I saw three weeks ago and the one who makes these new albums, you know? It's like uh, Charlie Watts' is a jazz band compared to the Rolling Stones. <laughs> They're two different entities. The stuff he's done since the 90s is so, so good that I really, really do recommend that you check it out. And he has found ways of presenting it to us that is just unbelievable. 
So what happened was I ended up hearing My Name is Ruin, and I went back and started listening to all the albums, and then I bought this book. So this will be the last little bit of this video, and then we'll close out. So this is Revolution. This is, I believe, his second memoir. Um, his first one sort of, an, an, I think, an eBay find at this point. This is really, really great. I couldn't put this down. <laughs> it, it, well, I've, let's see, um, looking for the year, published 2020, so it's pretty recent. I've probably read a hundred music autobiographies, and I've written a couple. I'm very particular. Uh, a lot of them I like, a lot of them are garbage, some need new authors. There's been a couple where I stopped listening to the band because I so was disgusted by this band after listening, after reading their books. And a few of them are like, God, you're an asshole, or you're just an arrogant whatever. But Gary's was really cool. Really, really cool. I couldn't put it down. I kept reading things to my girlfriend, who didn't care because she didn't come with me to the show. She was like, go to New York on your own. I don't care. <laughs> but I was like, oh, my God, this is cool. And did you know this? Oh, wow, wow. He comes off in this as so incredibly humble. Like, um, like he knows, like he knows that uh, his career kind of, you know, wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the fans. He knows that uh, he lost his career <laughs> and that it may not have been revived. He knows that it's a small group of people that kind of got him going and it's luck and the music business is fickle. So he's very honest in this book. Well, you know, every book has a things that are not in there, but he comes across so honest in this book and so humble and down to earth that it makes for such an enjoyable read. I'm actually on his Instagram and uh, he puts stuff up that just comes across so real. And sometimes it's silly. He has photos of him and his girls and his wife. And, you know, sometimes there's silly, silly stuff. I think he had a Instagram post of his wife playing the kazoo. But it's just like, I'm an ordinary guy. I was famous out the door. Now, you know, I became an airplane pilot. And he just seems like this really, really cool guy. Uh, I mean, it'd be awesome to talk to him and to connect with him. And... I became a super fan after reading this book. I listened to the albums, I'd watch some YouTube videos, and then reading this, I was like, I have to see him. Like, I have to see him. Like, I think this would just be such a great thing because I've seen the YouTube videos, and I was right. And it was better than what I expected. It was so, so much better. So Gary Newman, guy who's probably not on your radar, a guy you, you probably might think is a joke too. But seriously, if you like your music darker, moody, industrial, metal, ethereal at times. Check out Gary Newman's new albums, anything from 1994, Sacrifice on Up, other new ones, Intruder. Um, check out his book. I, I really believe it will inspire you. And, and check out his show if he comes to your town. I only saw him, what, three weeks ago? And I already can't wait for when he comes back to New England. And if it's Boston or New York, I'm ready to take another trip. And it was a seven and a half hour bus ride to go down there. I'm ready. I, I want to see him again. He was absolutely awesome. So I was going to hesitate and do this, this video later, but I didn't want to because I want you guys all to see this tour he's on. And I know for a fact that, because um, I've looked at reviews, that the band that he has now is the band that he has had, or at least the, the two guitar players so if you don't catch this tour catch the next one and I will also say of all the reviews I found and I kind of went back in time a little bit I've not seen a bad review not a single bad review the guy is 66 going on 21 and is knocking everyone out the door like <laughs> I wouldn't want to open for him because I would just be like that's it I, I can't perform because he's just gonna throw me under the bus he is so amazing. So cool. Throw under the bus, probably. That's actually a bad term. I, I don't think he does this deliberately, so it's probably not the right phrase, but you know what I mean. He just blows everyone away. He is just so, so awesome. So, yeah, I just wanted you guys to check him out, check out the music, give this guy some 
time where you may not have. Um, I love hearing what old bands are doing. Sometimes they're doing their best stuff, and yet they're off our radar. We don't even know it. Uh, Tesla's a band that actually goes in that list, too. I think the albums they did after their reunion um, are some of the best stuff they've ever done from, like, what, 1991 on. So, uh, I, those albums are excellent. The early stuff we know and we're more familiar with, but we have to get out of that mindset and then hear the new stuff. And I think the new stuff we will become familiar with. As it is now, whenever someone mentions Gary Newman, I always my first song I think of is, uh, My Name is Ruin. Check the video out. Not Cars. So, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. That's why I want to talk about just this great review of a uh, guy from the past. And, yeah, I think we'll end it by saying this. My last thought will be, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da